Um, just a few short words of introduction about Dr. McReynolds before she gets started with her um, talk, Sherlock Holmes in Russia. Uh, Dr. McReynolds is a professor of history at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, she received her PhD from uh, the University of Chicago. Um, she is a, a, a prominent scholar with a, many publications uh, to her credit. Uh, she is currently interested in what she describes as middle ground culture um, and looking at the ways that mass communications and culture are being informed in the late czarist period. Um, she has written many books. She's uh, co-edited Entertaining Czarist Russia. Her first book was The News Under Russia's Old Regime. Um, she has uh, co-edited Russia at Play, and her recent book is, uh, that is going to be forthcoming from Cornell University Press is called Murder Most Russian, True C Crime and Punishment, 1864 to 1914. Uh, Dr. Mark Reynolds' work has also been published in many journals uh, across the historical spectrum. Um, she has received prizes for her work. She's received the Norris Hundley Prize, from the Pacific Coast Branch of the American Histor Historical Association. She's also received the Health Prize from the American Association for Women in Slavic Studies. She's received grants and fellowships from a number of prestigious uh, foundations throughout the country and international foundations, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Social Science Research Council, Council, Council um, and, and IRIC's um, uh, grant. In addition, she's received a grant from the National Council on East European and Eurasian, Eurasian Research. Um, so if we could get started, I would like you to join me in welcoming Dr. McReynolds to Villanova. Thank you. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, Lynn Hartnett for organizing this week and for inviting me here, and uh, Adele Lindemeyer, our dean, for sponsoring the larger umbrella of Russia. Russian Studies at Villanova. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Suddenly, we heard a nervous knock at the door. Come in, cried Putulin. In the doorway stood the, stood the senior agent on duty, pale and quivering. Sir, there's been a horrible crime, he said. What's going on, Putulin asked anxiously. We've just been informed that corpses have been found in three different areas of the city. What's so terrible about that, my friend, asked Putulin. You didn't let me finish, sir. All three bodies have been found without their heads. What, without their heads? Futilin jumped up. Uh, yes, their heads have all been cut off. Judging by the freshness of the blood, the heads were cut off very recently and evidently not from corpses, but from live people. Thus begins 11 headless corpses, starring fictional chief of detectives Ivan Putilin, the Russian Sherlock Holmes. Although written in 1908, the story is based on the factual Chief Putilin, who had run the St. Petersburg Detective Bureau in the second half of the 19th century. This heroic Putilin hailed from a distinctively Russian genre of crime fiction, one that traced its roots back to the first years of his uh, time on the job in the 1816. And Putilin, for all the invocations of him as uh, Russia's Holmes, stands instead in sharp cultural contrast to the brainy Brit. It is the differences between the two, not the similarities, that allow us to investigate how fictions of detection lay out the clues to understanding the cultures that created them. The generic conventions of Russia's crime fiction, that is, the formulaic elements that give this crime fiction cohesion as a genre, emerged from Fyodor Dostoevsky's Canonical Crime and Punishment, written in 1866, and itself a response to the recently reformed legal system that had inspired the author. A murder with no mystery, Crime and Punishment fe featured a sympathetic killer, a police inspector unable to make an arrest, and even when he'd identified the guilty party, and the cold-blooded murderer of two elderly women seeking repentance from God rather than from the state. Raskolnikov, the novel's protagonist, protagonist confesses first to God, <coughs> thereby expressing his remorse, and later to the police. He bears his Siberian exile easily because God has forgiven him. 
Following Dostoevsky, other Russian writers explored the why of the crime rather than the who, producing why done it's rather than who done it's. Indeed, Russians wrote crime fiction, distinguished from its better known literary successor, detective fiction, focusing on the story of the crime that the detective seeks to solve. The narrative structure of the two, crime fiction and detective fiction, is reversed, and so are the central protagonists. The criminal acts in crime fiction, the investigator reacts in detective fiction. I'll show you Putil in here, the Russian Sherlock Holmes. The two genres overlap in plot, but thematically they address different social concerns. Crime fiction takes up the ideolog ideological challenge of why individuals transgress the boundaries established by the society of which they are members. Detective fiction, on the other hand, evolved on a parallel course with the modernization of law enforcement, underscored by the increased use of science in investigations. This genre speaks to the bourgeois instinct for law and order, because these stories conclude with the police at the door. Even when Chief Putilin caught the guilty, as we shall see, he did not always put them in prison. And here's our Putilin. Russian readers enjoyed detective fiction in translation from Emil Gaborio to Sherlock Holmes, but their homegrown investigators cared less about clues than they did about motives. Significantly, Russia's fictional investigators drew from their factual counterparts who served in the office of judicial investigator, which had been created by the, the uh, recently reformed legal codes from 1864. Within a few years of taking the lead in investigating crimes, several of these law enforcement officers published memoirs that skirted the boundary between fact and fiction. One Nikolai Sokolovsky, one of these judicial investigators, uh, factual, located himself on the side of the accused, writing, someone has committed evil in all of its deformity and he stands before you. Even keeping in mind that the most sacred personal rights have been violated, your hand is nonetheless shaking <clears throat> as it grabs the stone and readies to throw. The accursed questions arise. Who is guilty? Any day fix spins in your brain. Society, the clumsy way it poses and decides life's most uh, vital questions, or the person affected by physiological defects or an inexorable fate, you cannot give a straight answer. Another investigator, Pavel Timofeyev, echoed this. The psychological and moral aspects of every society leave their prints on the crimes committed by its members. No one is born a criminal, but criminals are formed from life, poverty, passions, and tribulations. One case that Timofeyev recorded was particularly compelling for its tragic dimensions. Investigating the failed suicide of a peasant woman, and uh, suicide was against the law in Imperial Russia, he believed her to be concealing the true motive for her attempt, that poverty alone had not driven her. Piecing together the tragedy that was her life, he discovered that she had been raped by her father, then her brother, her brother then fathering her children. The woman at least found peace when she confessed to Timofeyev that she had murdered her depraved sibling. He did not arrest her. The first and most prolific writer to fictionalize the exploits of these men was Alexander Sklerovsky, also misnamed him the Russian Gaborio. He enjoyed greater writing ambitions than his skills could accomplish. Limited further by alcoholism, his cry to Dostoevsky that, I am a writer too, captured his, frustra his frustration at being a second tier talent. But he played a specifically cultural role by extending the reach of the genre of crime fiction. Whereas most authors create a single detective personality with whom they are, they, um, are identified, such as Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes or um, uh, 
who else? Gaborio and Inspector Lecoq. Um, Sklarovsky rotated nameless judicial, nameless in, in judicial investigators in and out of his stories, each with a different personality. In What Prompted the Murder, he used the literary device of, pre of presenting the case as notes of, an, notes of a judicial investigator to encourage authenticity. The unnamed investigator is dispatched to the apartment of a retired colonel found stabbed in his bedroom, the dagger still in his heart. Three women are at home, all possible suspects. The victim's wife insists unconvincingly that he had committed suicide. This strikingly unprofessional investigator develops an emotional attachment to the wife, a former actress, because she reminds him of his own mother. His emotions are such that he wants to postpone interrogating her until she is rested. The police doctor accompanying him refuses to allow this because of all the evidence stacking up against her. She was heard having a loud argument with her husband the night of the murder, her face is bruised, and her husband was sexually involved with other women. A search turns up bloody clothes in the wife's bedroom. Another character appears suddenly the victim's illegitimate son. Listening to this young man's pathetic autobiography, the inspector developed a decisive antipathy toward him. It seemed to me that he was painting like an artist, the unhappiness of his life in especially dark colors with the goal of making an impression on me. As the investigator correctly surmised, the young man was guilty and had returned home when he learned that his uh, adored stepmother was under suspicion. The son had come to Petersburg on the night of the murder, and wandering aimlessly, he had ended up by accident at his father's home. The stepmother had let him in and hid him under the bed when the colonel returned unexpectedly. When the father begins to attack his stepmother, the young man, the young man jumps out from under his hiding and stabs his abusive parent. Concerned about the effect that arresting her stepson might have on his unrequited lover, and with no direct evidence against the young man, and no stomach to pursue the mother, the investigator simply lets this case lapse. In a postscript written from someone in the procurator's office, Sklarovsky informed the, informed the readers that the killer had escaped to America, the stepmother had joined a convent, and that the inspector had died of cholera. The author noted that he was a good man but weak. He went too much by his feelings. This would become the hallmark of Russian crime fiction, the difference between legal and personal justice. In another Sklarovsky story, the investigator protagonist claimed to be inspired by British detective novels and vowed to, to follow only the direct evidence in this case, derived from the murder weapon, a belt that had been used to strangle a young woman. Following the belt led him to the wrong man. He later discovered that a woman had killed her half-sister because the latter had abandoned her husband in the provinces, moved to St. Petersburg, and then let her reputation slip in places like the El Dorada and the Grand Plaisir. The murderous sister worried that uh, the lost reputation would reflect badly upon herself and her own decent husband. As the investigator tried to arrest her, this cold-blooded killer ripped her dress, cried raped, and told the police uh, who responded that the inspector had threatened to plant the belt on her if she did not return his sexual favors. Our ersatz hero lost his job and the murderess moved with her family abroad. His attempt to solve the case by following the clues did not produce the same ending as it would have in British detective fiction. The crime novelist Sergei Panov's Murder at the Ball from 1876, I don't have a picture of Murder at the Ball, but this is from the same era, the, the covers of the, um, uh, this crime fiction. This is Murder from Jealousy. A local beauty is found during her, uh, 
a local beauty is found during her com coming out party in her bedroom with her throat slashed. The investigator put in charge turns to local gossip. And he discovers that her desire for a more, inspir it, for a more inspiring life had led one girl to kill her best friend because the latter had stolen her fiance. After confessing, the guilty girl pines away in prison dead before her trial. Righteous justice is served when the homicidal girl's brother kills his sister's faithless lover in a duel. The dead man's, the dead man's immoral acts had put the murder in motion, which made him the truly guilty party, and he is dead in the end. Ending the heyday of judicial investigator as protagonist from the 1870s is Peter Tilyepnov's Murder in the Pusirovskia Baths from 1879. This novel fascinates because how it begins as a Western detective story, but ends as generic Russian crime fiction. In the uncharacteristically macabre uh, opening, an expensively dressed man and woman enter, uh, rent, a, with, excuse me, rent a private room in a public bathhouse. He later leaves alone carrying a box. The suspicious attendant then discovers the body of a woman in the tub minus her head. Enter the investigator, who establishes an identity for the victim from a series of interviews that he conducts about missing girls, following the deduction. Once he knows the victim, he pieces together a narrative of motivation involving an ex-lover who is now engaged to a wealthy widow and therefore trying to conceal his relationship with the victim by killing her. At the moment of arrest, this man shoots himself. Lo and behold, the woman thought to be the victim returns to the city not knowing anything about what had happened. Innocent of the murder, the uh, suspect had nonetheless been guilty of dishonesty, so it was therefore appropriate that he had taken his own life. Ten years pass, and the investigator uh, runs into the purported victim by chance at the opera. When queried about whether or not he had ever found out to whom the head had belonged, or who had removed it, the author responded, Well, dear reader, I have no answers to these questions. Whether it was the incompetence of the investigator or some other reason, I don't know. The bloody deed about which I wrote was turned over to the will of God. Although the genre faded from popularity in the 1880s, crime fiction continued to appear in novels and on stage, strikingly characterized by the convention that the guilty need not be caught and punished by the autocratic state. Moreover, the motive for the murder predominates over the fact of the crime, which could locate the meaning of guilt outside the law code. When the popularity of the genre picked up again after the 1905 revolution, although the characters and pacing were somewhat different, the morals remain the same. We return to Putilin, whose creator borrowed from some, some of the trappings of Conan Doyle's super sleuth, such as a medical doctor as a sidekick, uh, Ivan Nikolaevich in place of John Watson, and a penchant for disguises but the analogs give way rather quickly. Post-1905 Putilin be behaved more like the wave of American detectives that washed over Russian readers after 1905, Nat Pinkerton and Nick Carter. Though born in American and German pulp fiction, Russian writers also pinned serial adventures during the so-called Pinkertonovshina or Pinkerton mania that uh, reached its height around 1908. These Americans came from a tradition that understood detectives to be more visceral than cerebral and to use guns and fists where Holmes and Gaborio had specialized in quiet observation. Many a murder is committed, but the function of the um, <coughs> fictional transgate, excuse me, the function of the fictional transgression is to give the hero and occasionally the heroine, the opportunity to, to extricate himself from life-threatening situations 
and especially to travel at high speeds on modern modes of transportation. And here I have two uh, covers from uh, Nat Pinkerton, The King of Detectives. Among the Anarchists, him with Bob Ruland here in blackface, escaping from the Anarchists. And uh, here he's taking on Legrand, the King of Adventurists. <clears throat> in The Criminal's Conspiracy, Nat found himself in danger. The situation was desperate. Anyone else would have considered himself a goner, but not Pinkerton. The criminals pre prepare to shoot him on the count of three, but I will go on two, and Nat tosses a grenade from his pocket. In Arrest in the Clouds, Pinkerton begins on an express train in Chicago, from Chicago to New York, gets off in Cleveland because he has seen a hot air balloon take off in the direction of Richmond with a man being hanged by the guide wire. He fulfills the promise of the title, Arrest in the Clouds, when he climbs into the, to the, 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 gondola, the gondola of the scoundrel's balloon outside of Atlanta. Pinkerton's escapades pale next to those of Nick Carter. And here we have Nick the, in the Brotherhood of Death and Steam Engine Number 13. Appearing first in, 1886, in an 1886 dime novel written by American John Russell Coriel, Nick faced Russian nihilists early in his career and almost found themselves married to their Tigris chief, uh, Princess Olga. The publisher forced Princess Olga to imbibe poison in order to keep Nick celibate. These serials gives, give lessons in American exotica. In 1908, when the San Francisco public loses confidence in the police because of the growing number of white men killed by yellow ones, Nick takes on corrupt cops, Shanghai Jim, and a gang of slant-eyed devils here in the Brotherhood of Death. You can see them. Where is Dr. Quartz, the most evil and dangerous man of his time, begins the dead witness. Quartz was supposed to have been hanged in a Kansas City jail on Christmas, uh, on Christmas night, but a hurricane blew in and took him with it. When his prison uniform is discovered in the Missouri, in the Missouri River, only Nick believes correctly that the villain has survived. Aided by the last surviving member of the Jesse James gang, Kvartz kills his benefactor for the cash remaining from their bank heists. Kvartz, sub Kvartz subsequently, subsequently breaks his vile companion, Zanoni, out of prison where she sits for having murdered her sister. With his trusted crew of Patsy Dick and the Japanese lad Tin Anitsi, Nick captures the deadly duo. Carter doubts, though, that he has seen the last of these two who never found prison much of an impediment. When someone starts heaving bodies from, of strangled engineers from speeding trains in the steam engine number 13, the railroad company in St. Paul hires Nick. Solving the case, he escapes being buried alive in the coal car and gassed in his hotel room before ending up on the cow catcher of another engine, as we see him here, lurching from side to side, chasing the one in the title. The killer, powering number 13, has escaped from an, from an insane asylum, and as Nick grew closer to him, he grew wild, his bloodshot eyes shining with uh, predatory ferocity. Thick drops of sweat roll down his, bla his face, blackened with coal dust. These series, these serials inspired visual images that complemented the nascent cinema, a new medium for crime fiction. Putilin appeared in both serial and cinema uh, installments. Tellingly, Russia's movies borrowed from its other crime fictions, the, the, uh, borrowed from its other crime fictions, the ambiguous tropes of crime and punishment. The Secret of House Number no. 5 is one of the precious few from the era remaining in its entirety. That's available from the Library of Congress if you get a chance to go see it. Reviewed as grippingly interesting to watch, House Number no. 5 opens with a count and a courtesan at a restaurant where a gypsy dances madly in the background. The intertitle reads, Intolerable Luxury. 
The audience looks with her eyes at a handsome young man and feels her attraction. He shows her an unpaid promissory note, and their glance at the count indicates him to be the object of a plan. They engage him with a story of a mysterious house where the portrait of a woman comes to life and tortures to death anyone who tries to spend the night there. The count accepts their bet that he cannot survive. That night, the portrait comes to life as the courtesan steps out of it. The lover, who has disguised himself as a janitor, shoots the count in the back. They take the money from the corpse and replace it with a promissory note. <coughs> and, excuse me, the, they took the promissory note and repla replace it with a faked suicide note. I could not bear the expectation of the horror. The director did not pose the question of how the Count might have shot himself in the back. In The Five Emeralds, two strangers on a train begin chatting. The woman shows the man a brooch with five emeralds. He drifts off to sleep. Awakening, he draws the blinds to find the woman strangled, scratches on his hands, and the brooch in his pocket. He suffers no compunction about selling the emeralds for his personal wealth but does remain curious about what happened that night. Not even the hypnotist he hires can help him regain, regain his memory this, and where the brooch came from, and the law never renders justice. Russian, gener Russian viewers generally preferred villains <coughs> to heroes in cinematic serial action. The appeal of the, appeal of the outlaw Someone undermining the state's authority at every opportunity requires no explanation when writing about czarist Russia. Models for fiction came from fact. Sofia Blufstein, or Light-Fingered Sonka, uh, known as Light-Fingered light Sonia for her ability to pick a pocket, had captivated newspa newspaper audiences in the 1880s. After escaping one incarceration by seducing her jailer, Sonka ended up on the Russian uh, prison island of Sakhalin. In 1903, she found herself a heroine in a short story who at trial uh, claimed the highly contrived motivation to steal not for myself, but for those who suffer. She appeared in a, on screen in a six-part serial from 1914, Our Rocambole and Skirts, another French connection and misnomer, flirted with a well-dressed gentleman in a park. Perhaps a bit too much, perhaps a bit too much, because Sonka ends up pregnant like the Sonka on Sahalin. Or could it have been the man who kept pouring her alcohol? She avenged herself after sobering up by stealing from him and then setting his apartment ablaze. Serialized Sonka took her viewers into a courtroom and then into a mental institution which she had eluded, where she had eluded jail by feigning, in, uh, by feigning madness. Still using fire as a modus operandi, Sonka escapes the asylum by burning it down. The most cynical of all Russia's protagonists was Sashka the Seminarian from 1915. Enough remains of serial Sashka to appreciate the Seminarian's natural aggressiveness. In one scene, he pretends to beat his girlfriend so the uh, passerby will come to her aid. Sashka then follows the Good Samaritan home, back to his room, and pulls a pistol on him. Moreover, this, cinema, this serial cinematography is mindful of Maurice Tournure's most, more sophisticated alias Jimmy Valentine, also from 1915. Alias Jimmy, Jimmy Valentine is a classic of a cinematic crime fiction. Scenes of a bank robbery spotlight the bars, for example, that separate the tellers from the robbers, foreshadowing a jail cell. And as just as Jimmy outwits the detective who keeps him running, so, so Sashka gets the better of Selyeznov, the, the sleuth on his trail. An, es an essential difference, though, Jimmy reforms where Sashka does not. And I want to show you a couple of other, whoops, she's out of order. Lord, this is Lord Lister, the, uh, uh, the great unknown. Or the, great, the, this is, the story here is White Slaves, where he, in fact, 
uh, I'll talk about Sherlock Holmes more a little bit later, but Lord Lister gets the better of Sherlock Holmes in this Russian crime fiction. Again, the villain the, is preferable. And this, I just wanted to show you him because so little is known about him, Treff the Wonder Dog. Russia actually does have a police dog who becomes a hero in crime fiction. It's based on the, the real Treff of the St. Petersburg de Police Department. Um, before Rin Tin Tin, there was Treff. Okay. Uh, it is Police Inspector Putilin, the representative, the representative of official law enforcement, who tells us the most about the refusal, refusal of Russian crime writers to transform crime fiction into detective fiction. Observing that, sometimes I think that not even doctors and priests, our most intimate witnesses, have heard as many secrets as I. Putilin displayed the same sympathy as the judicial investigators from the 1860s for whom, murder, for whom murderers had been seduced by the circumstances to kill on the spur of the moment. As Putilin ruminates, an hour earlier, this person did not know that he would slash or strangle and then wander around in a daze, unable to forget. Where Putilin differs from the pre-revolutionary investigators is the increasingly graphic descriptions of violence. And you can see this from the cover, especially of the man taking the ax to him. Here are in the illustrations, you see another man with an ax, mindful of Dostoevsky, and actually some fairly prominent Russian murders. And I love the fact that uh, He's taking kind of, for my money, the wrong side of the ax to the man, but what do I know? <laughs> I've never killed anyone thus, so that might be the more effective way. The Putilin stories speak directly to the anxieties left over from the terror that had roamed the streets during the 1905 revolution. The Petersburg Jack the Ripper opens with sidekick Dr. Ivan Nikolaevich being awakened to, to conduct the for a forensic examination of a young woman found disemboweled in a house where no one knew her. I'm quoting now. On the stone floor of the vestibule lay the corpse of a young woman completely nude. A cross had been carved out in her stomach her inter and her internal organs were spilling out. What is this? What's going on? I turned to my colleague, the police doctor. Well, not a cesarean section. We doctors prefer, prefer to perform that more carefully, he joked. <laughs> I did not think that amusing and glanced at Putilin. In the Petersburg Jack, the policeman in charge arrests a janitor when he cannot explain the wound on his hand and a search of the janitor's apartment uncovers a diamond ring. Uh, I want to pause for a moment to explain that this is also mindful of some of Putilin's factual cases from the 1860s, well, 1860s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, this is a particularly famous case from 1866 that involved Putilin wrongly arresting janitors when, uh, because they, they, again, couldn't explain something, found something in the, in the apartment that belonged to the, the people who lived there. And <clears throat> I also want to show you illustrations. This is the, the picture, the photograph of the peasant woman who actually was the killer from 1866. And you can see how in 1916, the story has become sexualized. You know, just a transformation of the genre from realism to a kind of um, more open uh, graphic violence, her bloody handprints on the door. And it's not just Putilin. I'm going to be speaking for a minute about, in a minute, uh, about Sherlock Holmes's The Speckled Band. And we can see that uh, in the 1880s, it's more sedate, but we've got uh, prone women with their clothes falling off by <laughs> after the turn of the century. <clears throat> All right, back to the Petersburg Jack the Ripper. Putilin is more interested in other residents of the house especially the engineer who had not moved out when other frightened residents had left. 
someone moves in, a gentleman with sidebirds, Putilin, famous for the mutton shops as you've just seen, uh, who flirts with the engineer's maid, Masha. Readers familiar with the formula will recognize uh, the, the engineer to be the killer and Putilin the flirt, otherwise the engineer would not have stayed. Gaining access via Masha to the engineer's rooms, Putilin reads the engineer's diary and learns that he had been betrayed by his wife and vowed to take out his revenge on other unfaithful women, such as the victim whom he had seduced into coming home with him. A young woman in Putilin's employ entraps the killer, the female detective, a familiar example of how fiction often improved upon women's factual lives. Get back here to Ethel King. Whoops, come on, who was out of place? Just a minute. There. And this is Ethel King, the female Sherlock Holmes. <clears throat> Despite the brutality of the Petersburg Jack's crimes, Putilin assures him that, because he has obviously suffered a nervous collapse, the detective, the detective will testify on his behalf. His jury dispatches the killer to a hospital rather than to hard labor in Siberia. And does Putilin share Sherlock's keen powers of observation? The human Satan, its title scarier than the culprit, begins. Early in the morning of November 25th, the beat cop on Semyonovsky Square found the corpse of an, un of an unknown man lying face down, his hands tied to his body's torso. The cop went directly to the station to report his terrible discovery. Investigating further, the vi in the victim's pocket, Putilin found a block of grease-stained cards and a few needles. A more careful examination of the corpse showed that the middle finger on his right hand had been pricked several times, obviously from needles. Putilin deduces that the cuts on the, vic on the victim's fingers identify him as a tailor, and he sends a cop undercover to eavesdrop on patrons at a local bar. And this again borrows from the true crime from 1868, uh, how this, the, the peasant woman had been discovered by eavesdropping in a bar. Ultimately, Putilin depends upon the confessions of one of the title characters, the human Satan, one of his henchmen, to capture the human Satan. The fact that the victim was a tailor had no bearing on the case. So much for deduction. Significantly, in addition to his putative name, namesake, Putilin, Sherlock Holmes enjoyed various incarnations in Russia, brought to life by local writers. Holmes's trademark logic opened him up to burlesques that made his rationale excessive, and his disguises became caricatures. Middlebrow, middlebrow playwright Grigory Gay penned a two-act comedy, The Crimes of Sherlock Holmes, in which Sherlock appears as a female correspondent for a, U a European newspaper, but identifi identifiable as an American because he touches all the objects in the room, and who but an American would do that? In Sherlock Holmes, the day in the, A Day in the Life of the Great Detective, a one act written for the cabarets of the early 20th century, author Mikhail Linsky satirized Sherlock's famous powers of deduction. The victim who had been chopped to pieces, pronounces Holmes, could not have committed suicide. One scene scoffs at Holmes' famous hobby. Disguised as a musician, he plays a violin so touchingly that the villain who hears him breaks down in tears and promises to mend his ways. True, Conan Doyle created a character with such identifiable attributes that he lent himself easily to character, to caricature, and there is nothing uniquely Russian about satirizing Sherlock Holmes. The Russian lampoons, though, that made his logic an obsessive trait complements their own cultural preference for the why done it? Another Sherlock who devoted himself to cracking cases in Russian popular literature was penned by Not Doyle. This Holmes worked accompanied by Harry Taxon, a young man with no apparent skills in either medicine or narration, but ample muscle. Sherlock solves a crime that involves Canadian stock, that involves Canadian railroad stock, but the Russian touch shows itself when of the two men who forged the, the stock, one commits suicide and the other escapes to France where he lives happily ever after, 
on his ill-gotten gains. Futilin's ghostwriter also tried his pen at Sherlock Holmes. In a five-act play from 1909, he put the famous detective up against Arsène Lupin, the French gentleman thief, who also enjoyed a Russian audience on page and screen. Lupin has been accused of a murder that, the audi that he did not commit, and Holmes is summoned from London to track him down. Holmes constantly asserts himself as the representative of the law, which can only add to the audience's preference for Lupin, whom they know to be innocent. When the two confront each other at the end, Holmes challenges Lupin, asking, what would happen to society if crimes went unpunished? Did you ever think of that? We would all become the defenseless, the, the defenseless plunder of villains and swindlers. Lupin, the thief, counters that he will continue his ways until that time when society learns to understand human need. A violent, visceral home, <coughs> a violent, visceral Holmes and Watson travel to Russian in a series of stories penned by Peter Nikitin. Here, and this is on the tracks of the, the criminal and uh, Sherlock Holmes in Russia. This Sherlock acquired, had acquired his fluency in the Russian language and fascination with Russian culture when he rented a room with board with Russian immigrants during the two years that he lived in Buenos Aires. Something of a Siberophile, the taiga, in the taiga, Holmes tracks down, tracks down hunters of live people, a gang that slaughters sport hunters and gold miners for their wares. Action subsumes detection, as Holmes warns his own gang of ragtag miners that we don't have the power to arrest them, which means that it will be necessary to destroy them. Of course, it would, of course it would be better to take them alive, but that's not likely. Then he shouldered his rifle and a loud shot rang out in the quiet night. Imitation may well be the sincerest form of flattery, but it is also affected by the cultural specificity that uses imitation to say something about the imitator. A comparison of two stories featuring Holmes and Putilin that share much in common reveals more interesting differences. Putilin's The Poisoning of the Millionaire Heiress mirrors Conan, Conan Doyle's The Speckled Band. In both, a young woman due to inherit a fortune and living in the house of an older guardian who stands to collect if she dies is threatened by an inexplicable illness. In the Putilin version, she is bedridden and in Conan Doyle's, her twin sister has already died mysteriously. The answer to both mysteries lies in India. Deadly flowers uh, from there are poisoning Putilin's millionaire, uh, millionaire heiress, and Holmes's speckled band is a poisonous swamp, swamp adder who kills one twin and then, uh, released into the bedroom by their nefarious stepfather, threatens the other. Putilin disguises himself as a, prof as a professor neuro neuropathologist and holds, and holds vigil at his patient's bedside. Dozing off, a nightmare reminds him of another case which was un in which an undiagnosed illness turned out to be murder. Waking up from the dream, Putilin accidentally discovers the source, a red flower with a poisonous scent that the, other, that the um, uncle had brought back with him from India and hidden in a bouquet of dried flowers at the girl's bedside. Happenstance triumphs deduction. Holmes, on the other hand, fully, con fully conversant in the British Raj and herpetology, identifies the snake as the weapon uh, as soon as he finds himself in the lethal bedchambers. Equally significant is how the two stories end so differently. In the Putilin version, the heiress's fiancé refuses to press charges, happy to have his beloved safe. The wicked uncle passes judgment on himself and takes his own life. Holmes, however, sends the snake back to its master, whom it bites and kills. Putilin, like Holmes, 
undertook the, st the task of reconstructing a full and authoritative na narrative of the crime, but they diverge on critical points, especially the function of logic and the legitimacy of serving judgment. In neither case does the state have the last word, but Holmes's villain unwit unwittingly drinks his own poisonous medicine, while, as it were, while Putilin's villain judges himself. However fully rounded Conan Doyle's character, clever his deductions, and intriguing his use of cocaine, the universal endurance of Holmes's popularity requires fuller explanation. Appearing as he did at the turn of the 20th century, his modern methods made order out of chaos, defending the bourgeois values and imperialism that were preventing the sun from setting on the British Empire. Entering domestic situations made vulnerable by the commission of a crime, he gained the confidence of the, the principal characters through his objectivity and competence. And then Holmes departed, returning to his status as the outsider and without making any further demands. Michael Chabon pointed out that it has become commonplace to view the Holmes tales and the, the detective story that they engendered as fundamentally conservative. In this reading, the detective, while technically independent of the law, is in truth the dedicated agent of the prevailing social order, a static hierarchical structure in which murder is an aberration. Upon unpacking the case of the cardboard box, Holmes, Holmes queries, what is the meaning of it, Watson? What object is served is served by this circle of misery and violence and fear. It must tend to some end, or our universe is ruled by chance, which is unthinkable. Holmes's observation points to an important epistemological difference between the role of the detective in Russian and detective fiction. Detective fiction has its source in the comforting certainty that an acute eye, private or otherwise, can solve the crime by inferring a causal relationships among the clues. In doing so, the detective's actions replace the construction of the, I quote from Holmes, the well-made positivistic universe. By, privileg by privileging chance over positivism, uh, the Russian, Russia's crime fiction did not re restore that universe. It wrote instead a counter-narrative that rejected the closure found in the Western genre. Putilin and other fictional detectives dealt with crime as they understood it, as the actions of individuals push beyond the bounds of their humanity. Ambiguity was their hallmark. The authors demonstrated by writing about these crimes, these issues, that they shared their readers' aspirations for justice. But by rejecting a law and order closure, they showed their hesitation to embrace the desirability of restoring their own prevailing order. The formulaic ending that reified the lack of a, a law and order solution had political resonance in Russia. Russia's crime fiction reveals an attitude toward the repressive autocracy that can be characterized as passive aggressive. Passive to the, degree, to the degree that it did not confront representatives of the state directly, and aggressive not only in its villainous heroes, such as, such as Sashka the seminarian, but more subtly by permitting even sociopathic killers to evade punishment by the state. Crime that captured the imagination without the need to capture the criminal, reflected the significantly low level of commitment to Russia's dysfunctional system of law enforcement. Russians, readers and writers alike, always returned to that question that had been posed by Sklarovsky, their first genuinely popular crime novelist. What prompted the murder? Then it was up to the killer to fend for himself or herself with his God. Thank you. Thank you so much.
so much, you've given us so much to think about. Uh, at, at this point, I'd like to open it up and see if anyone has any questions. Yes. Uh, do these books have the same long-lasting effects that like Agatha Christie and Conan Doyle stories have? Are they still popular in Russian culture? A very good question. Uh, that would be yes and no. These, Putulin has not continued, he's been reprinted. But the detective fiction, I again call it the crime fiction, that emerges after uh, the fall of communism in 1991 has the same generic formulations. The Marinskaya, she's the most popular female detective. Uh, she's, a, she's actually like Putulin, a representative of the state. Um, it doesn't end with arrests. It, there's a lot of happenstance. There's a lot of, um, uh, I want to say mystery, but then that, <laughs> that's confusing because that's the wrong word. Um, um, she imagines things, things come to her in dreams. So, and again, we don't always end with the capture of the criminal. That's just not what matters most. So the, it's fascinating to me that these properties return. Peter? Yes, sir. Um, do you see the fact that they are the, the um, it's popular because it's visceral it's not um, you know it's it, because it's not all about the intelligence you know you're not mm -hmm. reading it trying to figure out does that make it popular because it's more um, relevant to the Russian person yes. that, you know not necessarily might not necessarily be the most read of people so that they can understand that better absolutely uh, they read it because it's about them because it taps into them when they're reading Sherlock Holmes, who is popular in translation, Sherlock Holmes is about Great Britain. He's fascinating, he's fun, but uh, he does not solve the, a lot of the, question, the questions that the Russians have about their own law enforcement and uh, its relationship to the state. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned dreams uh, in the story that yeah. was related to the cycle yeah. thing, and I wonder if that was a repeating theme in the story as important as dreams. I know in Crime and Punishment there were several dreams that Ross talked about that. Again, an excellent connection. Um, in this particular story, that's the one dominant dream, but beginning with some of the judicial investigators, even some of the true stories from investigate from the investigators, sometimes they have dreams and that the the killer will come to them in a dream. So that is an acceptable place to find, instead of just following the, the belt. I mean, I love the story where the guy's just following all the clues and it doesn't get him anywhere, uh, especially not the criminal. So yes, dreams keep figuring again and again in this crime fiction. Not everyone will have a dream, but it's an acceptable uh, medium for uh, investigation. And again, even among the, fiction, the factual uh, judicial investigators. Is there any sort of official reaction from the state to these stories that, you know, sort of, like, in a sense, criticized or undermined? No. no? Um, it, two things. First, um, <clears throat> the when I'm talking about uh, Sophia Bruchstein and some of the, these serials based on um, uh, outlaws, before 1905, the publishers would get in trouble who glorified the bandits too much. They had to kill off some of them, and Sophia Blues, she has to go to Sahalin. She, she doesn't in real life go to Sahalin, but again, what can the government do? It can clamp down on stories about her that, that give too much praise to her, but a picture, a photograph of her is taken in chains, and it becomes one of the most popular uh, postcards circulated in Russia, Every, in a sense. People know who she is and she's valued for the challenge that she puts to the state. She's a very popular character. So the government tries to tamp down. After 1905, the censorship really has lost power, and there's a, people who are most critical of this are the intelligentsia. It's the Lenins of the world who stamp these people down, not the Tsar's government. They destroy, you know, the, when the Bolsheviks come to power, they burn the stockpiles of this pulp literature. And there's a lot of stories uh, from the 20s about people uh, saving them and hiding them because you know, uh, the government didn't like them. Because the Bolsheviks want, want rid of these, unfortunately. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned, I, I think you said, a, a play in which Holmes was pitted against Arsene Lupin. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Holmes is, is set up as a representative of the state and asserts himself as a representative of the law. Yeah. Do you know when that was written in, in, in reference 
the publication of the home stories because I just I thought it was interesting because there are many home stories in which he lets criminals go and insists he is not responsible mm -hmm. for guaranteeing the application laws and say like he'll let um, there are some cases where he lets thieves and even murderers go free because he, he agrees with what they did or, or thinks they don't deserve the the penalty that would have been instituted by the state. Um, okay. The, the point that I want to make there, yes, you're correct. The point that I want to make there is the way in which the Russians are positioning Holmes and the detective as the, the more evil of the two. They, they put Holmes in a position where they can glorify Arsene Lupin and the thief is basically the point of that the play. It was not a particularly popular play. It's just interesting to me the way in which uh, the man who created the fictional Tealing deals with Holmes and Sherlock Holmes in a very different manner. Yes, sir. I've offered so much to save her, I thank you. One of the connections that I made uh, that I appreciate very much I, comes from uh, um, Dr. Rob's Oblomov, mm -hmm. where the German stops, you know, chides the Russian, his Russian friend, that you just don't know how to live. And if I recall correctly, Oblomov says, well, the Russians are geniuses, why to live? why and not so much Absolutely. how. So that whole idea of a, a why done it just makes so much sense. Thank you. Well, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, there's just, they're just very distinctively Russian. And it's more steeped you are in the literature, like the Robert <coughs> Dreams, the, you know, any kind of connection, uh, the russian this comes out. They become less bizarre. And really a much better way, better act, they give you much better access to Russia, to understanding Russian culture, I think, because of this. And the why just matters. I love, I think my favorite was when I was reading the, um, the mystery of the Kuzirovsky of Baths, when the victim, you know, this guy has figured out who the victim was and why she was killed, why she has her head cut off. She comes back. I mean, I was very surprised myself, although I've read so many Russian stories I shouldn't have been. And in the end, did you ever find out who did it? Did you ever find out? No. Okay. <laughs> it just wasn't important to the story. Yes. Um, I have to second Father Melinda's comment that there are so many things that are circling, circulating through my head um, that I'm so appreciative of what you shared with us today. Um, I wonder if you could to speak to a little bit about how widely circulated these stories were? If there was a, um, you know, who was doing the reading of these? Was there, was it a more urban phenomenon or um, a potential There was one? a, um, there was, we know that there was uh, from uh, about 1910, there was an attack, as I said, from the intellectuals on these, the, the Pinkertonish, you know, all of these serial, uh, the, the visceral uh, publications. <coughs> Nick, uh, Nat Pinkerton and Nick Carter and Yvonne Putilin, he was less popular than they were. Um, <clears throat> but as I said, also some of the, the uh, Russians also wrote some of these. It's easy to spot which stories were written by Russians by the ending. Suicide instead of arrest. <laughs> um, they're written, they were written largely for the young male audience. And uh, the, the, uh, there was a crackdown on them, and all, some several educators wrote in uh, pedagogical journals, wait a minute, don't be so hard on these guys. You know, Nat and Nick at least give positive characteristics. You know, we, we need to change the culture of Russian youth, so this gives them, the, you know, they're, they're out there doing something. They're taking action, they're trying to right wrongs. And so don't be so critical of them just because they're, uh, they're so silly about the, you know, Chicago ends up in Atlanta on the way to, to Richmond and uh, whatever. Um, and a lot, so there's a, they get, they collect more information. They collect information also from reading, the, you know, what were in the beginning of World War One, what were so, what had soldiers been reading. And it's very widely diffused. There are more men than women, younger than older, uh, workers, school kids, um, anybody coming, they're particularly popular among those coming of age, coming of, uh, you know, maturing, coming into yourself, 
after the 1905 revolution. happening on the, the, the continent with the, you know, the development of Lombroso and uh, 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 Henry Maudsley and some of the psychiatrists who were changing the way in which uh, sociologists looked at criminals. So that's very definitely a part of it. But it's also, there are also some specific differences between French crime fiction, Gaborio, and this Poutilin. So it's not so, it, there's also a distinctive French cast to its crime stories and a distinctive Russian cast to its as the British that I focused on, because I'm assuming that everyone's more familiar with Sherlock Holmes uh, than any other. You've probably seen the movies. I actually haven't seen the newest one. Is it good? It is. Robert Downey? <laughs> it's so American, <laughs> the first one was. Any last questions? Yes, Robert? This doesn't really have much to do with your presentation. I was curious, what other uh, genres that Russian folk writers uh, deal in or work in? Um, romance, true romance. Did you have something in mind? No, I was just curious. I've read some American folk writers, so I was just generally thinking, I mean, American folk writers, you know, Western, yes. Uh, oh, okay, 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 that's what you mean. No, uh, Russia does not have, um, <coughs> Russia does not have a, tr a tradition of Westerns, even in their expansion of Siberia has no analog to our okay. se a series of Westerns. Um, they're, they have some Horatio Algers type stories, uh, but not so much peasants, there's a, there's genres of peasants going into the world and making their fortune and then returning to the village instead of becoming rich and famous as uh, or rich and powerful as Horatio Algiers. So there are, yeah, I would say look around in Russia, uh, it would be the peasants trying to make them make good in some way. But I don't want to. Okay. I'm, I, 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 familiar with that pulp fiction more through secondary literature because my passion is the detective novel, so I've read thousands of these. Yeah, that's more interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I, don't, I don't care if the peasant comes and marries the merchant's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> I'll let somebody else do that research. You, for example. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs>